Okay, so the lecture Genes Within Populations is the beginning of our unit on evolution. What we want to focus on with this unit is the big underlying theme of life. Life changes. It evolves over time. Individuals don't evolve, but populations, species, those are the things that evolve. So in order to understand how species change and how species evolve over time, we need to look at their genes. We need to look at the genetic code and the gene pool that exists within a population. And is that gene pool or the certain alleles, are those things changing over time? So our little group of wild mustangs here, what do they have in regards to alleles within their gene pool? Do they have a lot of dominant alleles, a lot of recessive alleles? What are the genetics of that particular population? And over the course of generations, and that is the biggest key I want you guys to remember about evolution. We look at it over the course of generations. Are those alleles changing? Are they changing in frequency? Are mutations occurring, causing different expression of traits to happen? What's going on with the genes? That's the key behind evolution. The genes determine the phenotype, physical expression. Is that going to change within the population? So as we explore this unit, we want to look at genetic variation and evolution. So genetic variation is our basic raw material for evolution, the differences in the alleles. And when we look at genetic variation, that tells us over time if a population is changing. So we sample a population in 2015 and then we look at it in 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 and we look at it over generations to see if those genes are changing, if the frequencies are changing. Now that presents a huge challenge. So we have these deer, a bunch of little fawns born in the spring. They're all spotted. It's going to take a year to two years to see them reproduce, and then another year to two years to see their grandchildren, and then their great-grandchildren, and their great-great-grandchildren, so on and so on. So in order to watch the evolution of deer, we need to be around hundreds and thousands of years. It doesn't work for people. But when we look at populations that reproduce very quickly, like bacteria and insects and other species, we can see evolution in action. So that's what we'll be exploring throughout this unit is what we can see, how we can watch evolution occur, and then what we can predict, what we can determine from the lines of evidence about the evolution of various groups or various populations. Okay, so genetic variation is the raw material for evolution, and that is the difference in the alleles of the populations. Evolution is how a population, underline and stress that word, how a population changes through time, not the individual. It's not how does that one deer in the front change over time. It's how does the population of deer change over time. Are they all getting bigger? Are they getting smaller? Are the coat colors changing generation after generation after generation? So like I said, as we explore this topic, it's over long periods of time. More importantly, it's over lots and lots of generations. Okay, so evolution is not a new topic. Since the ancient Greeks, we go back thousands of years. Man has been trying to understand this and try to sort this out and come up with explanations. Now, in early, early time, the explanations were based upon myth and religion. This is what we think. This is what we believe, but not what we can prove, not what we can test, not what we can understand through a process of science. So lots of our early beliefs were simply based on, as it says, myth and religion. The Mayan creation story, their version is it took God four attempts to create man. God messed up four different, well, the gods, because there's more than one in the Mayan world. It took them four tries to finally develop and create humans. And there's a really interesting, fascinating story about the jaguar and the clay jug. I encourage you guys, look it up. 
that was held to be true to millions and millions of people for hundreds and hundreds of years as a belief. Is that one better than the other versions of relatedness and the other versions of explanation out there that are based on religion? Depends on your religious background. Some people would say absolutely not. My, my version, my religious belief is the correct one. Why not the Mayans? Why not the Incas, the Aztecs? They're all right in the religious context, but they can't be backed by science. That's why we want to separate these two realms. And that's something I will strongly urge you guys to do, is separate science from religion. You do not use science to prove religion. Religion is faith-based. It's fantastic. It's faith. You don't need proof. But you can't use that faith as a, as a version of proof. I believe so it is. It doesn't work in the scientific realm. So we're going to look at evolution as a scientific concept. That's the fact I want to drive home. The scientific concepts behind it. What can we test? What can we prove through the scientific method? If you cannot design an experiment, test it, and gather data, it's not in the scientific realm. It stays over in the faith-based realm. So man has been trying to understand this for hundreds and thousands of years. In the 1800s, the scientific community, the scientific world was expanding dramatically. It was growing rapidly. And people were exploring all different corners of the globe and really, really starting to see and discover lots and lots of things that they had never discovered or never knew existed. So different explanations were being presented back in the 1800s. So this giant mammoth, or mastodon, was discovered. Didn't live in the, it wasn't alive on Earth in the 1800s. It's not alive on Earth today. But we had to have some kind of explanation for why we have a mastodon in the fossil record, yet it's not alive today. What is the reasoning? What is the explanation? So George Cuvier came up with an idea called catastrophism. Catastrophism has these four key components to it. He felt all life was created at the same time. Boom, there it is. The 1.8 million species we know of on Earth, all of them created at the same time. The species were fixed. That's a huge, huge thing to keep in mind or to really, really focus on is the fixation of species. So Cuvier was really, really focused on that species are fixed here. Let me underline that. All right, and he felt, you know what? Things don't change. There's not enough time for those things to change because, you know what, the Earth is only 6,000 years old. So species can't be changing. They don't evolve. They don't change over time. They're fixed because we live on a young Earth. There are people today who still hold true to this belief, to the catastrophism. The Earth is only 6,000 years old. So when presented with these fossils, and Cuvier actually was a fantastic paleontologist. He, he studied fossils. He identified things in the fossil record. He was fantastic and phenomenal with identifying this. He rationalized why the mastodon was in the fossil record, but the elephant wasn't by catastrophism. And he was saying that certain species were wiped out by natural disasters. So... Volcanic eruption came in and wiped out mastodons, but left behind elephants. A flood came in, wiped out mastodons, left behind elephants, and so on and so on and so on. And that was the rationale he used, he presented, for why these things were in the fossil record and not alive today. Even though we have something similar alive today, the mastodon did not evolve into that elephant. Instead, they were all contemporaries side by side at the same time, and disasters wiped out certain species. So back in the 1800s, a lot of people held to this belief. Lots of folks felt that was the best explanation for why we have the diversity of life on Earth that we do. So other explanations were presented. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, he came up with this idea 
called the inheritance of acquired characteristics that acquired variations these things are passed on to your descendants that you can pick them up and develop them during your life and then pass them on to your kids so in the top left corner here we have a short neck giraffe similar to the modern day okapi basically a skinny horse with a slightly elongated neck so the ancestor of the modern giraffe was this animal here and they some of them had such a desire to live that they could actually stretch their neck out so Lamarck coined this thing called fluida interna the internal fluid that allowed certain members of that giraffe population to stretch their neck make a longer neck so every day they could get their neck to grow a little bit longer a little bit longer a little bit longer so could keep reaching food that was higher and higher and higher and it could survive and then eventually time to reproduce I got this really long neck because I've been stretching it out for the last three or four years now it's time to reproduce and my kids are gonna have really long necks my kids are gonna have these really elongated necks because that's what I've developed and that's the variation that I've worked with during my life my children will inherit that some people believed it some people opposed it um, the opposition was that well you don't things don't change during their lives they don't you, know, you don't go from the short necked individual to a long necked individual over the course of your life um, but Lamarck was moving in the right direction towards evolution where he messed up or his not hitting the bullseye was that you don't acquire variations during your life you have them from birth you express them those variations that are beneficial adaptable successful those are the ones that get passed on because those are the individuals that tend to survive so Lamarck was close but not exactly there A simple experiment shows that Lamarck's idea doesn't work take a mouse and this is going to sound terrible, but take a mouse, cut its tail off. So it had, an, had something happen to it, lost its tail. When that mouse reproduces, its children will not be born without tails because the mouse lost its tail. They're going to be born with tails. So you don't acquire variations during your life and pass that variation on to your, your offspring. You have the variation all the time. Some individuals survive to pass on their variations. Others do not survive to pass on their variations. Okay, so, so lots of different explanations were being presented to try to understand what's going on with evolution. So when we study it, we're going to look at population genetics. So these flowers out in the field, they're a huge population. Thousands and thousands of these plants producing these flowers. And what we will see is that in population genetics we're studying the changes in the allele frequency of the population over time specifically over generations so changes in allele frequency of a population over time but specifically generations okay that's the key behind population genetics changes in allele frequency over time or more importantly over genetics so in order to do this we take a look at and use a thing called the Hardy Weinberg principle this is studying changes in the allele frequency by using what's called the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium so we'll start exploring this in the second lecture of the evolution chapter, um, the genes within populations uh, lecture here.